And welcome to the uh, April session of our DSUA webinar series. So today we've got some really good presentations lined up for you with some very knowledgeable and personable uh, presenters. We, we've had a lot of communication and discussion here and great group of people here that you're going to get to listen to today. So I am not Jerry Hunt. I am Travis Reynolds. I am the vice president of your uh, DSUA board here. And I'm honored to be able to host today's webinar. Um, looking forward to a good session today. A little bit about DSUA, if you're not familiar. Um, I imagine most people that are here have, have been involved or participated in several webinars in the past. But if you're not, a little bit about DSUA um, as it is. Um, DSUA is a nonprofit organization that's been around since around 2008. Uh, with the primary objective of collaborating and innovating for dry scrubber solutions, which includes SDA, CDS type products, uh, DSI solutions. And we also provide a networking venue here for um, end users, suppliers, and OEMs to get together and communicate and share information with one another. Annually, we, uh, in the past anyway, I'll say annually we have had a in-person conference. Well, as you know, last year we canceled that conference. This year we have also elected to suspend that in-person conference as well. So unfortunately, we're going to miss out on that networking opportunity that we have and the fun that we enjoy, or the good times we have at that, at that event, but we're going to maintain this monthly webinar to continue to share this information with you and be able to keep this networking channels open and uh, in play for everyone. Uh, also, just so you know, these, this webinar will be recorded, uh, as have all the past webinars, and they will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, and you can get more information from that by either contacting uh, DSUA or uh, you know, just reaching out to any of us here on the board that you know, and we can get you, in, in, get you the link to that YouTube channel. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One other thing that we're doing with this month's webinar is we are offering a raffle. And so any, um, any end users that are here on this, uh, participating in this webinar will be entered in the raffle and the, uh, the contribution for the raffle will be coming from Gecko, who is also a sponsor and we'll get into the, their information here a little bit as well. Speaking of sponsors, I do wanna thank the sponsors for uh, supporting DSUA. You know, this, this webinar, the conferences in the past, everything we do would not be possible without the sponsors and the support and the commitment that they make to this organization. So I will go ahead and roll in here to the, got to do a little bit of housekeeping here and get the sponsor stuff here uh, taken care of. Share my screen. So first off, we have uh, Primex. Primex uh, has been involved with DSUA for a number of years now, and you're most likely familiar with them because of the, if you've been involved with DSUA for very long, you've most likely seen or heard a presentation from Stuart Nicholson, who has been a regular member also on the DSUA board as well. Primex uh, provides comprehensive solutions to help customers with SDA, CDS, and DSI systems optimize their scrubber performance. They have uh, 20 years of experience behind them and they bring a unique combination of knowledge, technology, and patience to their customers. So we really appreciate Primex's contribution in the past and currently as well. GE Power is a sponsor this year as well. And GE Power offers uh, steam power technology for fossil and nuclear applications, including boilers, generators, steam turbines, AQCS systems, and uh, digital solutions. They uh, provide performance over the life of a power plant. GE Steam Power has installed 30% uh, of the world's steam turbine capacity, 50% of the uh, steam turbines for nuclear power plants, and 30% of the world's boilers. They have approximately 1,500 steam turbine module retrofits as well. Uh, GE is able to support customers with a wide range of uh, solutions and has a uh, extensive fleet of field service engineers and personnel available to support you in whatever your situation and needs are. 
Lawast. Uh, Lawast North America is a uh, Lawast Group subsidiary, and they are a global limestone, lime, hydrated lime, and silicate minerals supplier. Uh, Lawast supplies high quality calcium based products, including the Sorbacal SP and SPS uh, products. Um, they use their sorbents to neutralize acid gas and flue gas. Uh, processes and industrial flue gas, I'll say power and industrial processes. Uh, Lois sorbents are applied across uh, numerous industries, as I indicated, including waste to energy as well, cement, glass, pulp and paper, and chemical manufacture. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to Ian Saratovsky, and uh, the email and information is provided as below, as well as uh, uh, Jerry Hunt, who is the president of DSUA and uh, today's host, or I'm sorry, today's moderator. Um, finally, for this first sponsor uh, commercial type set, uh, we also would like to thank Reaction Analytics Solutions for sponsoring this as well. They are specialized in providing engineering solutions using CFD modeling. Uh, the founder, Dr. Guisu Liu, has worked in this, this field for over 20 years and he's modeling uh, fuel combustion and emissions controls over that period of time. He has provided over 100 CFD-based engineering design and optimization services to various utilities, engineering firms, and industrial owners. RAS modeling experience covers everything from front-end furnace combustion to back-end flue gas treatment systems. If you need to reach out to them for anything they can support you with, uh, the information is shown here in this slide and we greatly appreciate their sponsorship of the DSU organ DSUA organization and this webinar. So I'll stop sharing here real quick. <clears throat> so I would like to introduce our moderator for today. Our moderator, as I indicated earlier, is Jerry Hunt. He is no stranger to this organization and to the, those of you who have participated in these webinars and even the conferences as well. Jerry is the president of DSUA. He has been for a number of years now. He is a, uh, I'll say just personally, he has done a fantastic job leading this group. He provides great leadership and direction to those of us here that are trying to do our best to support the organization to bring those of you that are members and participants the best information and stay as connected with you as possible. Uh, Jerry is manager of flue gas treatment applications at LAWAS North America as part of the business development team. His role at LAWAS North America is focused on growth of the Sorbacal SP and SPS enhanced hydrated lime products in the DSI and CDS application uh, target market. Uh, he additionally focuses on providing technical support to end users in troubleshooting their systems as well as optimize, optimizing system performance. Prior to his time at uh, LAWAST, he spent five years working as a senior wet FGD application engineer for Siemens and two years working as an industry technical consultant for Nalco Mobotech. He also spent one year as a DSI process engineer at BCSI. Uh, overall, Jerry has spent 15 years in the AQCS industry working on a multitude of wet and dry FGD applications and technologies for uh, scrubbing of acid gas and mercury, uh, partic mercury uh, emissions. Um, Jerry currently lives in Florida, but grew up in upstate New York where he graduated from State University of New York Buffalo in 2005 with his master's degree in chemical engineering. So Jerry. Yeah, thank you, you. Um, for all the compliments. Uh, I know before this, you guys were, were humbling me pretty well with trying to pronounce last names and whatnot. So. Um, so I will take the I'll take the boost at this point. So um, before I introduce our first speaker, I just wanted to send a reminder to all of our listeners that if anyone has any questions out there in the audience that you can submit them through the Zoom platform and myself, as well as Travis and the speakers will kind of keep our eyes peeled and do our best to try and get around and make sure your questions get answered as soon as we we notice them. And um, but if something happens and we don't answer your questions fully or we happen to miss them, then we'll do our best to follow up and, and make sure we get something back to you in writing. So um, having said that, let's uh, let's introduce our first speakers. Um, we've got Paulo Oliveira from Envia, as well as Dean Kotecki. 
Um, Paulo, he's a regional sales manager uh, based out of Kansas City for the Central South USA, uh, focused on gas analyzers and process optimization instrumentation. He's got approximately 20 years of experience in doing technical sales, both domestically and internationally, uh, including air pollution control systems such as spray dryer absorbers uh, in past work with Alstom as well as BMW. He's got a bachelor's as well as an MBA um, out of universities out of Brazil, and as well as an MBA degree from the University of Tennessee. Uh, he's also got a green belt certification from the University of Tennessee and a certified professional sales leader by the National Association of Sales Professionals. So Paulo is going to be leading our first presentation, but we've also got Dean. Dean is the North Central Sales Manager for Envia, and he's a process specialist for all their sensors and electrodynamic products. So I'll turn it over to you guys, and you'll hear uh, the title of their presentation is Multi-Instrumentation Approach for Fine-Tuning of Dry Scrubber Operations. So I uh, will turn it over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate it. Thanks, Travis, for the for the introduction as well. Um, so a few. Let's let's first share our screen here, right? There you go. And we're gonna see the slides. They're gonna pop up. Presenters mode off, and we should be there. You go. So uh, a few things we need to acknowledge, right? So thanks one more time, Travis, uh, Jerry. Wanted to wanted to say thank you to everybody with the with the association for helping uh, with the organization and you know helping make this happen. Amanda, Mitch, uh, uh, as well. Uh, Want to say thank you to our marketing team, uh, Kathleen, for for supporting with the with the slides and organizing things. So it's it's I'm, I'm really happy to see some some old colleagues like uh, Travis and, and and Mike from previous companies we work together. So it's always a great pleasure uh, uh, to, to work together with you guys one more time on this uh, on this webinar. Uh, we need to and this is this is pretty quick. I need to. Um, address the elephant in the room, and it's not related to Travis at all. Uh, it's snowing in Kansas City. So it's April the 20th. And the only person happy is my four-year-old daughter, of course, because she's only four. It's, uh, it's pretty unusual in Kansas City, but I can see my backyard. It's pretty white right now. So people up north, they might be laughing at me like, come on, Paul, really? It's another day in the office, but it's pretty unusual in Kansas City. So who, who would have told you doing a webinar and the snow is just falling down. So there you go. Got my colleague, Dean, that's going to support me through all the presentation. Uh, without further ado, so let's let's go. So we're going to I'm going to talk about instrumentation, instrumentation, multi instrumentation approach on and how we can fine tune the operation of uh, SDAs. I'm going to spend just a, a quick minute to, to, to tell uh, the audience about Envia, Envia which is uh, it's a French company. We are present in almost 80 countries, uh, a little bit more than 700 employees worldwide, uh, 100 million euros in sales. Uh, and and we're, we're now in our history close to 40,000 ambient, uh, ambient air monitors and short of 30,000 uh, gas analyzers, both uh, uh, process and 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 related and, and related to the permits, air permits. So uh, we've been out there for a little while since 70, uh, 1978 in the U.S. We're based out of Chicago. That's where the main office is, and 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 that's where everything is located, right? So marketing, finance, project management, uh, spare parts. In, in, in field service, well, field service coordination, uh, coordination right? We got a 15,000 square foot warehouse uh, shop up there where we do the assemble, the fine tuning, and, and, and of course we stock parts. Almost like a million dollar, uh, million dollars in, in spare parts in Chicago, just to make sure that it's a French company, but it, it's, it's got a pretty solid local presence. 
for those out there that they might recognize, we were Altec back in the day before the transition of the, the, the name, the consolidation of the brands. We were Altec uh, 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 a few years back, but now everybody under one, one brand, Altec environment, right? With that said, I'm not going to explain combustion process, SDA. I think we're all familiar with that. Uh, but this is to, just to show, and by no means with these, uh, with these uh, diagram, I'm excluding coal-fired uh, uh, power plant users at, at all. It's just a representation of a combustion. It's a boiler. This is a trash burner. The reason why it's selected, uh, we selected a trash burner because that's the the, the reference case I'm going to mention at the very end, where we consolidate all the technologies, uh, uh, everything in one in one plant. So it's just for reference. It's a boiler. Uh, it could be any boiler. It's just that in this case, it's a waste energy plant, right? And we're going to talk about it later. What we're going to target, the focus is really the red square, which we are all familiar with, you know, silos, injection, uh, the scrubber, and and a filtering device. Most of the times it's a, it's a bag house. We're gonna go one by one pretty quick and then we wrap them up. I'll try to follow a sequence of the process from up, upstream down uh, further from the stack all the way to, and then I introduce the, the gas analyzers and then we wrap it up with the, with the case. So let's start with sorbent, with the injection, right? So. Typical case on an SDA, you got the silos there where you're gonna have, a, at this point, I'm gonna say sorbent, but it could be a number of things, hydrated line, uh, sodium bicarbonate, trona. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to mention, uh, uh, limestone slurry would not be included because this is solids measurement, right? So this, these, these devices uh, we're gonna talk about are for solids measurement and at the end, gas analyzers. So we're not doing much in slurry at this point, but on, so if, if I use sorbent hydrated lime, it's just at the end of the day, it's all sorbent. Uh, I'll try not to pick just one of them, but as we know, uh, the sorbent injection, it's key because that's the fundament, uh, the, it's, it's in the fu uh, fundamental part of the reaction with sulfur and acid gases. And the dosing of the of the sorbent, it's it's a key point on an SDA on a, a scrubber operation, right? So one of the solutions that we have is that the, a, a device that's gonna measure that injection rate. And one of the the, the device that we chose is, is our solid flow. It can measure up to twenty tons an hour. So higher massic flows, right? And, and it's a sorbent injection, it's, it's gonna, everything is gonna made automatically. Um, as we tie with the, with the gas analyzer at uh, later in the presentation, um, that's, that, that sorbent injection, it's gonna be re related to how much SO2 it's coming down the, uh, from the boiler, the exhaust of the boiler, and that's gonna relate to the stoichiometry of the process and just just precisely correlate and make uh, the, the necessary injection of sorbent to uh, neutralize SO2 and other acid, uh, acid gases. You can see a little bit of some of the technical specs. When we get the PDF out there, uh, these, uh, uh, the name of the products, we try to, I try to keep it as a, uh, it's a, it's a hot link. You just can click and go to our website and there's going to be plenty of references on manuals, data sheets, and what have you, right? So uh, uh, the customer's benefit, avoid overdosing or underdosing. If you're overdosing, uh, uh, you know, you're going to, re uh, there's going to be a clear cost reduction. If you're underdosing, you're going to catch up and make sure that you're under the, the air permit compliance. Uh, effective control and very simple retrofit option. So as you can see on the right corner, that's usually, so as I talk on the right corner, there's gonna be a picture of the, the, the sensor 
and uh, 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 an example, a, a case, as, in you, as you can see on this specific case, it's outside of the main gas stream, right? So it's external. So it's not installed in the gas path. It's still talking about our silos and injection of things. Now the adsorbent uh, activated carbon, if it's related to mercury, if mercury is an issue and activated carbon is, if there's a need to inject activated carbon, the correlation is exactly the same as the previous slide. It's just that we got what we call the pico flow. It is, it is, it's also an instrument for massic flow measurement, and but for lower, uh, uh, up to 220 pounds an hour applications. So it's less dense. It's uh, the flow is a little bit less, just to make sure that. And we got instrument. It's not mentioned, but we got instruments that they can measure way higher massic uh, uh, flows not related to the usual flows that we see on, on typical uh, SDA applications. For the typical applications, those are the two instruments that we see uh, as, a better, as a better application. Continuous flow measurement, it's, uh, in, in, same in this case, um, enables reagent dosing and ultimately uh, uh, you're gonna optimize the activated carbon consumption. Silos, we're still talking about silos, the, the silos part of the process, right? So uh, this is a key question, right? How, as, a, as an operator, how do I know I have the, necess the, the necessary amount of sorbent or activated carbon to, to run my process? We have a solution on, on, a, on a silo level measurement uh, sensor. Uh, Hours runs on a microwave pulses, uh, pulses and contactless. So you got a, 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 a few pictures on the, on the right side where it shows the sensor, a typical installation, contactless. Uh, uh, the specs again, same thing. You can click, it's a hot clink, but maximum height of 390 foot, which is, you know, that would be a pretty, pretty tall silo anyways but uh, it's pretty robust. So up to 390, uh, 390 feet and max temp temperature of 390 Fahrenheit. So absolutely a great feat for the, the typical SDA application. Benefits, reliable. Um, you're gonna have control of what's inside, how much, not what. I mean, you know what's inside, uh, how much is inside the silo. Uh, um, and, and it's pretty maintenance free. Let's keep going downstream, right? So targeting right now, we're gonna go back to the gas analyzers, but now let's target a little bit more in a, on a bag house. And I need to mention this, by the way, um, a representation here on the left side, this could be applied. I personally, uh, uh, I haven't seen that many, but it's out there, uh, cyclones upstream. So th that's the reason why you can see that's a, a you know, representation of a cyclone. We're going to talk specifically about uh, the conveyor system uh, uh, underneath the back house, but you could absolutely translate that if you have a cyclone uh, at, at, at your plant at site. Most of the cases, so you got the ash conveying system the, the, the we all, you know, the, the, the typical bag house operation. Uh, uh, it's collected from the bottom, from the hopper, and you got to convey these to, to a secondary place outside of the main process, um, it is just quintessential that you make sure that you're getting rid of all that dust accumulation at the bottom of the bag house. So we have a flow detection device that you guys can see a, a field application here that's gonna detect flow, no flow of material. So you make sure the material is being carried out of the process, right? So contactless using microwave, we can go as up as, you know, uh, 1800 Fahrenheit and 290 PSI, which is with adapters, which is absolutely way more than a typical SDA application. So it will be a, a perfect fit, fast, reliable. It's important to mention that the, the Flow Jam, which is our brand, 
for that sensor, it's um, uh, 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 we have an option of a, 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 an evolution of the flow gem design that can detect if it's, so it's flow, no flow, but if it's no flow, it can detect if it's either blocked or it's just an empty pipe, right? So that's an evolution of our design that can tell the operator uh, flow, no flow. And if it's no flow, uh, it tells you a, a little bit more about the process. So as you can see on the picture, easy to retrofit, no contact with the, it's not in the main gas, uh, the material path. So, and you can relate that to the, and if, to the cyclones. Ash level detect detection at bag houses, this is, this is huge. We do not, we do not want to have hoppers that you're, they're just, and this could be a maintenance nightmare if they're just filling up, filling up, filling up. If this starts getting uh, at the bottom of the bags, this could cause all sorts of trouble in uh, maintenance wise. Um, and, you know, it goes with the, the whole money, man hours and everything to fix that. We got the pro gap. So it's, it's a microwave sensor um, that will help. It will tell the operators if there is any material buildups in, uh, in, the, in the hoppers. Hoppers with the use of the ash conveyors we just mentioned on the, you wanna make sure that you're just getting rid of that. It's just going, it was just, you, you're just getting rid of that and, 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 and taking to the secondary place uh, far from the, from the back house, that instrument Fast, reliable, easy to retrofit, as we can see on the picture, external to the hopper. Um, it will help the operator and the plant to avoid uh, uh, unnecessary uh, shutdowns, unexpected shutdowns. We, we really, nobody wants that. Um, and this sensor has also come with, it, it will come with an option of uh, indicating that at not only the level in the hopper, but indicates also the if uh, if there's material flow, right? Or if it's just not clogged and it's 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 just there, or there's there's a still, but if there's also material flow, so level detection, and and by the way, level detection we have this could be a thing also that you can apply back to the silos. It's not telling you, you know five feet, 10 feet, 15 feet, the level in the silo, but uh, using, uh, attaching those in the silo, it could be also a level detection device applied in silos. We have quite a few cases of those used for that purpose uh, out there. Hey, Paulo, um, I have a quick question for you, because I think this is a great subject that applies, as you mentioned, to a lot of things, um, you right. know, whether it's the sorbent flow in a silo or lack thereof, or uh, whether it's in the hopper of an SDA or the hopper of a bag house in a, in a CDS, you know, we've heard that issue of material getting wet or building up or bridging up. And so what, what kind of, I guess, what kind of information in terms of data, is it, is there some kind of numeric data? Is it sort of a binary flow, no flow? Like, can you help um, kind of tell us specifically, you know, what, what level of information, like I'm an operator sitting in a control room and I've got this installed, like help me, help me understand what information this provides. It helps me identify that bridging is occurring. Yes. So you, you depending on the sensor, Jerry, you're going to have, you're going to have, it's just a relay signal, right? It's going to be flow, no flow. You're not going to learn anything more than that. But if there's a device, if there's a sensor that will, with that, it will also measure other, uh, like a gas analyzer, if it, will give you, it will give you a range of uh, measurement, right? In this specific, the pro gap, uh, the, 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 the silo level that, uh, uh, measurement, right? That one will give you, it's not a relay signal. It will give you five meter, 10 meters, so it's four to 20, five, meter, uh, five feet, 10 feet, 15 feet kind of signal, right? This one, the pro gap, it's a relay signal. It's either yes or no. All those, uh, uh, you can storage, like you can use the, 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 the plant DCS. We have our own software 
also to integrate all that. And I will mention that when we bundle them uh, them up together. Um, so that uh, I'll talk about. Uh, I know when you mentioned to me, Jerry, that you know uh, data. It's it's is a hot topic for, for SDA for the industry, and I'll touch on that on my last slide. But it, it's related to the sensor. We it, it could be a simple relay signal. It could be a four to twenty, depending okay. on. And, and um, I had a quick follow-up question. We do have a question from the audience, but real quick to follow up on that. Um, sure. So it, it is, if I heard correctly, um, so like you said, it's kind of a flow, no flow sort of signal, but it, what, um, is it something that can measure, um, like what did you say it was microwave? So can it measure across the span of a hopper so that you don't, like say you get build up on one side of a hopper as opposed to another, like it'll, you know, it, it's not going to get necessarily plugged up. So, you know, you get, build up on one side and, you know, maybe it detects it only on one side. I guess my point is whether the buildup is consistent throughout the hopper, one side or the other, like you, this should be able to detect it with the microwave. Is that my understanding that correctly? That's correct. So okay. that buildup, it's not going to, it's, it's absolutely not going to bother the sensor at all. Uh, but as you, as, as, as the sensor will, will sense the, the buildups, you'll get an alarm. So something is wrong with the hopper, right? But it will not, it will not stop measuring at all, but it will let you know that something, and again, uh, uh, with the option, so uh, with the, that there's an extension, there's, a, there's a, an evolution of the pro gap that will actually tell you if there's material flow or not. So it's another signal coming out of the sensor that will tell you, oh, there's no flow, uh, the, the ash uh, uh, in the hopper reached to a certain level, and it will tell you if there's flow or no flow of material. Okay. So not only tell us it got to that level, but it will tell you that's an evolution of the program okay. that, that okay. we have. So it will help you with that one as well. Uh, we did have a quick question on this one before you go on to the next slide. Um, in terms of the, the program uh, level detector, the question is, does it have to be locked out to safely enter the hopper due to the microwave signal crossing the hopper? I would say so, yes. All right, thank you. It's part of the instrumentation of the uh, uh, of the plant. Yes. If I can that offer just the least some... of your problems, if you're going inside a hopper, uh, yeah. uh, uh, for sure. If I can offer just a couple couple comments on, on the program. This is Dean Dean Kotaki. So the program they're typically set up with you're going to set up a pro gap. You're going to have a min, a max, and then you'll have what's called a max max setting. So your max max would would be the indicator that something's overfilling. Prior to your pro gap, you know, this is gonna be in the hopper. So the other product we had talked about initially was flow jam. So we have an entire family of that product. Your basic flow jam product is literally on off, flow, no flow. Then your advanced product is called flow jam plus. That's the device that will give you flow, no flow just like every other product in the market, but we also offer the feature then of telling you if the, if, if the area is empty or if it is blocked. And there's some other, a couple other different variations. There's a total of five products in that family. So we can address pretty much any condition with that product. Awesome. Thanks, Dean, absolutely. Mm -hmm. A couple of, uh, if we're still in the back house, a couple of slides on solutions for, we do not, we do not, the next slide we'll talk about a multi-compartment. Uh, we have a solution. We, we always try to get in front of the customers that, yes, bag, uh, bag replacement, bags uh, breaking frequently. Uh, this is a, a key major maintenance issue for the for the plant for the operators right so we have instrumentation specifically uh, to address that it is important to mention that we have as simple as the uh, sensors as simple as what people call broken bag detection but we go beyond that so what the way we, we like to call this on, on our on our bag house instrumentation devices, the view 370 uh, um, is, is, is an example. Uh, uh, we, we put it here. 
It's at the outlet of the bag house, mainly a smaller bag houses that's going to give you uh, related to the pulsing sequence, sequence and, and those kind of things. It's going to give you some intelligence about the bag house. We like to call it a, a performance, a bag house performance predict. We're going to uh, predict the bag house performance because it might include an element of a broken back detection, but what we want to tell the users is that with our software, our controllers, and learning the sequence of cleaning of the bag house and, and, and a few other pieces of information, we're going to tell the user, the operator, uh, when a bag is about to be broken, right? And try to avoid the I mean, we all know the pain that comes with uh, uh, unexpected bags just breaking in the bag house. We have the technology and the knowledge to apply to a bag house operation and, and, and predict when a bag is about to, to be broken, right? So the VIEW 370 is an application at the outlet of the bag house and usually for, for smaller bag houses. And in the outlet, there's really no fine, there's, you, you need to learn about the sequencing of, of, of the cleaning of the bag house. A solution that takes a step further on larger bag house, which is the typical bag house application on an SDA, is the leak locate 320. So you're gonna have the sensor. We can have, we have a presentation of the sensor here on the, on the right side on each compartment. That sensor will learn about the operation, the pulsing, the sequence on that specific compartment. It's gonna gather all that information, use our controller. There's a, a, a picture showing on the picture as well. And with our software, we're gonna give this feedback to the user in terms of uh, 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 you know, prediction of operation of the bag house. So, Potential savings in operation and maintenance are just, are just tremendous with this type of application. We can, uh, uh, it's, it's important to mention, and, and, and I know I'm, you know, it's now 25 minutes, but the, the questions are coming. So I think it's, it's a good mix. Uh, uh, it's important to mention the electrodynamic. It is our patent. Most of the users out there, if they are familiar with tribal electric, this is not tribal electric. It's our patent. The sensor will not be, there's not going to be influence of dust deposits on the sensor, does not require direct contact with the sensor. It's a, a, it's a field that's surrounding the sensor that's going to make the reading, and we extract intelligence, our algorithm, out of that. So it, it, it needs to be mentioned, it's not the tribal uh, type of technology that we see on the sensors out there. It's our design. It's our patent. So the savings, even customers, it's important to mention that even customers that they say, oh, my bag house is working just fine. The natural next question is, how do you know, right? Because you might be using a tribal electric uh, a sensor that's just covering dust and you're not really reading anything. And you think like, oh, we're good. We're cool. Actually, you're not. Right, so our that device will help uh, will help on that sense. And I need to. We're almost there. I'm going to touch on a couple of slides on our gas analyzer, and then we wrap it up. Right, and I'm tracking 27 minutes. I think we're on time here. Uh, this is how this is how the company was born. Right, Mirror. It's our it's our working horse. Is the brand that we're getting out there for decades now. The gas analyzer, that's, um, we got a couple of brands here. The Mir 9000 and the LIS 300 are just a couple of a, a toolbox of several type of gas analyzers that we have. The gas analyzer here will play a very important uh, a part because you're going to install it upstream of the, um, of the scrubber. And the gas analyzer will tell the operator that how much SO2 or HCl or HF acid gases, how much it's coming down the pipe to the scrubber. 
the natural thing, the natural next thing you're going to do is, yes, I'm going to tie that kind of information to my instrumentation at the silos so I can correlate. And that's going to help me fine tune uh, uh, the operation, uh, how much injection of, of a sorbent or uh, activated carbon we need. A couple of things on the main broad differences, the MIR 9000 is infrared, the LIS 300 is cross duct, so it's a laser beam throughout and you know across the section area of the duct. Uh, but this is extractive, this is all at uh, close to the to the main pipe at the source using laser spec, uh, spectroscopy uh, uh, so different technologies, but at the end is to measure the, the, the chemicals, the, the, how much SO2, HCl, HF, it's coming down the pipe so we can optimize the, uh, the SDA. The savings are just, here's a, here is the latest and greatest on our MIR family, this picture, which is the MIR 9000E. It's just, we're gonna see, it's still the MIR family, but the case at the very last slide, it will show a specific solution that we, we use for that customer. Hey, Paulo, I, I have a question for you real quick. Um, sure, sure. In terms of the in, inlet analyzer, um, I mean, I agree, you know, in the value of utilizing that, but I also, you know, a lot of end users, it's not common to see, say, an inlet monitor. And I think, my, it, I guess the feeling is it's, you know, everyone cares about the compliance numbers at the stack, and maybe this is viewed as academic. Now, the folks that you've seen install inlet monitors, you know, if I'm an end user and I, I want to try and convince my management, hey, the, there's value, monetary value in these inlet analyzers. What's been your experience in terms of, you know, how people have been able to demonstrate that value and what that brings? Because uh, certainly there's a there's a capital cost associated with it. And then there's, you know, someone's got to spend the time and resources to maintain it. So, you know, how can you help me elaborate a little bit on, on the value and how other end users can sort of help elaborate the value in that to their management to justify this? Because I think it's a great tool and I wish everyone had it, but it is a cost. It is, it is a cost and, and it's a gas analyzer, right? So there's a fine tuning, there's a maintenance, there's operation, which is pretty, it's, 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 you know, it's a real reliable device and, and, and there's not that much, there's no headaches uh, 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 at all related to, you know, the usual annual maintenance of the device. I am gonna set up the, high, the bar pretty high and I'll explain that on my last slide, but Veolia uh, in France, they saw up to a 0.17% savings in consumption on, uh, on sorbent. So if we're looking just strictly for a payback, it's right there, savings, but you know what? It goes beyond that. And maybe I'm just putting the, <laughs> you know, the carriage is just passing the, the, the in front of the horses here. But, and I was talking to the, the, to the, one of the guy that was uh, at that plant, you can look into other things uh, uh, related to the fine tuning of that dosing, right? It's landfill cost. You might have, you will have uh, less, uh, uh, you're gonna collect less if you fine tune the injection, less at the hopper. It's also savings in the landfill. Uh, he was telling me, and I'll touch on those uh, items, Jerry, uh, on, on my last slide. Uh, I'll try to wrap it up, but just throwing it out there, the payback, it will be related to savings, uh, uh, savings on the consumption of sorbent. And, and, and I, I want to further develop that, right? Because that's the last slide. This is the second to last because it's the same hey, mindset. Paula, real quick, sorry to interrupt. We did have a question from the audience. So I wanted to get that with you real quick is, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Kevin Redinger asked, with the gas analyzers, is there any impact from the exposure to alkaline ash in the flue gas on the results in terms of presumably, I think like native scrubbing on the, the tip of the, the analyzers or anything on the analyzers? So you know, is there any online cleaning that's necessary? Yes, we need to know the, the ash content. We need to know the, uh, how much particulate, how much ash is coming from the process. That's a key thing and it's part of, part of our site survey. Uh, uh, it will not be an issue, but we have, and Dean helped me out. Uh, we have processes to uh, self, uh, it's self-cleaning. We have uh, uh, um, 
we have pro procedures in place to, to, to help with the reliable measurement on those analyzers, but we, it, it's a known fact. We need to know uh, 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 the, the, the particulate, uh, the, the sizes and how much particulate, but. Yeah, we can, uh, we'll adjust the system based on the flue gas composition and the dust load characteristics. So if we have to put in a, a probe that's suited for a certain dust content at the site, that, that's not an issue for us. If it's a combination of high temp, high dust, whatever the case may be. If it's very acidic, uh, we have the capability to set things up, you know, with the dilution system. So we can address, we can address anything hot, hot, wet, cold, dry, uh, in situ measurements. Um, if we go back a slide there, a lot of the customers, you know, on the inlets, um, if, if it, depending on what the desired measurement is, that's a, that's a good location for a cross stack TDL, which is essentially maintenance free. You look at it about every six months, uh, but it's limited to ammonia, HCL, HF, CO low, CO high, and, and for an O2 measurement. But we, we have an entire family of analyzer products outside of the multi-gas. So we, we can address virtually any site condition. Hey, Paul, I just wanted to give you a five minute warning on the, Absolutely. On the time slot. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, you know, gas analyzers, we could go, and I was trying to keep this under control here, uh, uh, you know, CO gas analyzer for boiler uh, uh, operation, right? Fine tuning of the boiler operation. Water, so, you, you know, there's a leak in the boiler. We could go as further back as I was just trying to keep things under control, but those gas analyzers, they can provide all sorts of intelligence. This is just releasing the market. Uh, market. It's, a, it's an evolution of our mercury analyzer. Uh, it's a continuous ma measurement, so it's, it's a SAMS as well. So it's an evolution of SM4. Uh, the evolution comes as such, and it's just a few things I need to mention here because they are unique. No catalyst, we're not gonna use, there's no, so catalyst replacement or mercury, and this is valid also at the stack, right? For compliance, it is also valid for those. This design, no catalyst, no need to replace, no gold trap, and we can go as, it's virtually nothing but five micrograms, which get down, gets down to the EPA, you know, down to the PPBs with a B as in Bravo. So it's, it's the, the maintenance on this uh, evolution of the, our analyzer design for Mercury, it's, it's reduced uh, drastically just for the simple fact that you're not replacing catalysts, you're not replacing gold, uh, gold traps or any of that, and you're getting as low as readings on five micrograms, right? Wrapping it up. So had an interview yesterday, last night with, um, well, my evening, my, my afternoon with the Veolia plant manager or chief engineer um, that we hired. He was working for Veolia and he is now part of our team in Germany uh, as the chief engineer. He was running and that's now the reason why we picked the trash burner as a whole representation of a, an SDA process. He was the chief engineer of a Veolia site in France running uh, 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 his plant where we sold and he's not the only one, but it just so happens that he's now a colleague running our gas analyzers and the flow measurements, uh, measuring sensors at the silos. And that's, if I could, if I forget everything that he just told me yesterday and I could remember one thing, which I really love it. It was like, Paulo, uh, it is, there is value. You can get as much value out of that as you want. And I love the way he said, like, you know, if you're a plant, you have six days, you have six weeks or you have six months. They took the longer road of really fine tuning. So working on all the interlocks, 
working on, on, on all those instruments, working together with his existing DCS. And, and he was like, Paulo, just by installing this, I got 5%. But then we're like, yeah, six days, you know, what, what else can we do? And that's when he kept working with our field guys and, and our engineering up to six, uh, six months. And, and it was not six months of our guys sitting there. It was also on their side. The fine tuning, they got to a point they were saving 17% on sorbent consumption on, their, on that specific site, right? So just just by installing those things and integrating all of them pretty quick he got easy easy five percent there was a, a component also uh, on how did he sell that to the plant manager right uh, um it was a node site it was a node site and they knew it was running uh, uh things were uh, uh unbalanced and they knew something had to be done so we came on a, on a very good timing that they had the budget and we told them the payback, uh, uh, it will be specific. And he got actually 17% was more than, than, than what he as the chief engineer was expecting. And, and working with the fine tuning of all those sensors and all those technologies together, he got it. Uh, uh, the plant is happy right now, it's, run, it, it's running. He knows it's running. He had, you know, he he checked with the with his his colleagues uh, uh, recently, and the technology is there. It's running. They're happy, and they're getting uh, uh, they're getting very very nice, very good results out of uh, out of our application. The picture shows just. I know it's IS, but it's part of our mirror technology. Uh, it's just that as uh, uh, you know, there's there's a whole portfolio of analyzers, and as Jean specified, it has to be looked one side at a time, uh, uh, handholds, and we're going to help the the end users as we did in France uh, to find the best analyzer, the best solution, and all of that. But in this case, it was it was a pretty pretty happy reference in uh, that we had with with our technologies. Yeah, and if I can make just a quick comment, you know, going back a little bit, um, the question with dust again, you know, we can do extractive systems, whether it's hot, wet, cold, dry, we can do the in situ, um, we can do close coupled, um, we have a number of solutions. So the, the most important thing is, you know, we just want to understand your site conditions. Um, we are not limited by by technology, either from the gas analyzer side, uh, we have multiple mercury products. Uh, we can even do burner optimization with a multi-gas cross stack tunable diode laser. Uh, laser. You know, that was that was presented at EPRA a, a few years back. So uh, just, you know, any questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, we'll, we'll address them if we need to after this session. Yeah, we appreciate it. And I know, uh, uh, you know, our uh, time slots up and uh, I think there was some good stuff in there. And, and certainly I think, we, uh, you know, this is a dialogue. I think there's a, there's a billion questions that could come out of this. And yes. I think there's a lot of value. And I, I know I always hear a statement that uh, the worst thing you can do is make decisions based off of collecting bad data or no data. So um, and I'm kind of a data junkie myself. And so, you know, we I think we have some more questions. We'll follow up with you guys. Um, after about, you know, how to address some of those questions. But um, Jerry, yeah, I, I think some good stuff, but the takeaway I got from this too is uh, consult with the experts because every, every site has custom yes. conditions. And, and so there's custom solutions as a result. Jerry, just wanted to mention, there's no .com. People, they get confused. We don't have .com. So good, it's India.global. <laughs> thank you. But thank you uh, both Dean and Paulo. We appreciate that information in your presentation. And uh, Real quick, before we turn it over to uh, Mike at b and I'm going to kick it back to Travis real quick uh, to uh, acknowledge our second set of sponsors. Hey, Jerry. I couldn't get off mute. Sorry about that. That's all right. You're good. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go through our uh, halftime set of uh, sponsors that we greatly appreciate supporting DSUA here. So kicking us off here, we've got National Filter Media, 
Uh, National Filter Media takes pride in being one of the world's oldest and largest providers of air pollution control and liquid filtration products. Uh, they, have, they have achieved success by adhering to the same business principles since the firm was founded in 1906. They firmly believe in building partnerships with customers and earning their business every day. So while filtration technology has changed substantially since 1906, National Filter Media's commitment remains the same and wants to be long-term partners with their customers. <clears throat> me. Uh, Leckler, for over 140 years, Leckler has been designing and manufacturing uh, spraying solutions for air quality control systems and other applications with a wide range of nozzles, nozzle lances, uh, valve stands, mist eliminators, you name it. Lots of different spray. When you think of spraying stuff, you, you know, Leckler has, a, has something for it, basically. Um, working working uh, very heavily in the uh, desulfurization, denitrification of flue gas processes. Uh, they advise customers individually and help them to develop solutions that can reliably, reliably meet even the most stringent emission requirements. Uh, Leckler experts understand spraying technology like no one else. And I also want to take the take time here to uh, thank Stuart McKenzie for his time here supporting. He is a DSUA uh, advisor, and he has been instrumental in supporting us this year, both with just general DSUA tasks, as well as uh, the, the webinar series that we've got going on. Gecko Robotics. Uh, Gecko, they actually did a presentation here not too long ago that's uh, re really interesting to see. So if you want to go back, uh, I think it was maybe February timeframe, you can go back and look at uh, the presentation that they did. And that was very, very interesting about how they can use uh, robotic technology for doing uh, inspections of various uh, infrastructure and uh, vessels that they have. Any, any kind of components there, they use their robotic equipment their wall climbing robots to do the inspections here saves the customers from having to have actual personnel manpower to do this. They have these robots that can go in, provide heavily, uh, heavily detailed and thorough data analysis of different components inside the vessels. It's really interesting to see, um, you know, that they, they, uh, they have been supportive of DSUA for the past few years as well, whether it be Dave Kahan, uh, supporting us, whether, whether he was a board member or other individuals within the organization supporting us with the webinars over the past year. Uh, we, we greatly appreciate Gecko and their, and their uh, sponsorship of this event and DSUA in general. ReadyCam, uh, we thank Get ReadyCam for their sponsorship as well. They provide a range of equipment for flue gas treatment and air pollution control systems across various industries. Uh, they serve end users with technologies that meet extremely stringent emissions requirements in a very cost-effective manner. ReadyCam has a, a wealth of experience that they have collected and, and earned over approximately four decades of operational experience. Uh, they are a reliable partner that can work in whether it's a greenfield site or a brownfield retrofit type installation. Uh, similarly with ReadyCam, they also have a advisor that has supported DSUA for the past year and that being Salvatore Gallo. Gallo he, he's been instrumental in helping us to achieve uh, our objectives within the organization and as well with the webinar series that we have. So I would also like to take time to just thank uh, all of the sponsors that we have. Uh, obviously, we don't have commercial presentation slides for all of them, but every one of them has contributed to the success of DSUA, allowing us to continue to proceed in a, I'll say, a very challenging past uh, 14 months, roughly, uh, with, with allowing us to continue to keep the networking open, continue to exchange and share valuable knowledge and operational feedback of uh, dry scrubber DSI particulate removal systems. With that, Jerry, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, I appreciate it. And um, I know we're a couple minutes behind, I wanna make sure that um, our second presentation gets the full 35 minutes. So we, we, if anyone has to hop off right at 1130, uh, no problem. Again, stay tuned for the recording if uh, there's anything you missed, but 
Um, we'll make sure that this next presentation, we give them the full 35 minutes. So I'm um, going to introduce uh, Mike Clytus of Bab Babcock and Wilcox, as well as Mike, uh, Mike Wozniak. Uh, Mike, Mike Clytus is a subject matter expert with BMW. He's been there for 15 years. Um, his background has been in, uh, as a field service engineer, as well as a research engineer, and he currently has a title of environmental principal engineer. He's got a, his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from The Ohio State University, as well as a master's of, of science in chemi from Cleveland State University. And uh, the other Mike, Mike, Mike Wozniak, uh, he's a subject matter expert at BMW for the past 23 years, five of which he was a boiler performance engineer and also 18 as a, uh, in, in, I guess, an expert to the complement of all the environmental product lines that BMW offers. And currently, he serves as an environmental advisory engineer. Um, Mike also has a bachelor's in chemi from Youngstown State University. So uh, you got a bunch of chemis today giving presentations and talking. So um, Mike and Mike will be giving a presentation talking about spray dry absorber performance factors and upgrade options. So I'll turn it over to you guys and take it away. Thanks, Jerry and Travis. Um, so I'm Mike Clytus with BMW. We're a global company headquartered in uh, Akron, Ohio, and we offer re renewable thermal and environmental solutions. Um, and the topic of this is going to be some of our uh, environmental technologies and uh, SDA performance specifically, uh, performance factors there, and options to upgrade those systems. So to start, here's an arrangement of a typical SDA system on a coal-fired power plant. Oftentimes, there's multiple uh, spray chambers um, due to limitations in atomizer feed rates or uh, spray chamber sizing. In addition, a key component of this is the particulate control device, which is located downstream. So here's the agenda. We'll talk about SDA evaluations, um, and these are specifically the driver behind this presentation, the evaluations we've done recently, and how they can be applied to, to your facility. Um, we'll do an overview of the SDA systems, including individual system reviews, uh, to try to optimize those and get those working well um, and make recommendations there. And lastly, we'll finish up with some upgrade options um, in the last few slides. So the SDA evaluations that I mentioned, uh, recently we, we've performed several evaluations in support of state implementation plans to comply with the regional haze rule. Um, these are often to meet lower uh, SO2 outlet emissions. Um, and it, but in addition, the principles presented here also can lead to general improvements in operation, specifically reductions in lime consumption. So here are the SDA systems. We've broken it down into four systems, and we'll jump into each of them specifically in the next few slides, starting with the lime slaking system, then the ash recycle system, then the spray chamber and atomizer system, and lastly, the particulate control device. So for the lime slaking system, um, one key piece here is, is that normally we recommend a target temperature around 175 Fahrenheit. Um, this is due to the uh, improved lime slurry properties and, and the more reactive lime slurry that can be generated at higher temperatures. Um, but this is often uh, in part set by the lime quality as well. And normally when we're supplying these systems, we have limitations on, on lime reactivity and wanna make sure that the lime is suitably reactive to make sure that the SDA performs properly. Um, lime reactivity is one thing that we look out for, and typically we require around a 40 degrees C or 72 F increase uh, in temperature within three minutes, uh, and 100% of the lime should be slaked after 10 minutes. Water quality is also an important aspect to uh, lime slurry preparation. We normally implement limits on sulfates and carbonates because they have a detrimental effect in uh, the lime slaking process and the performance of the SDA. Um, in addition, um, however, if low quality water is available at the plant um, and a recycle slurry is in place, uh, adding that low quality water to the recycle slurry is normally a better place for it since that won't compromise the quality of the lime slurry. So the ash recycle system, one key uh, value we, we target here during design is uh, 40 to 45% slurry. Um, this helps maximize the alkalinity in the atomizer slurry. Uh, assuming the atomizer capacity allows. It also helps improve drying, which may allow operation at a lower approach temperature. This is an example SDA drying curve from an installation we have. 
you can see that as the uh, atomizer feed solids increase, the allowable SDA outlet temperature decreases. And this uh, decreased approach temperature leads to a savings in, in lime consumption. Um, and one key piece here in the ash recycle system, along with the normal maintenance from wear and tear, is, is to periodically calibrate the density monitor, especially if you have an intelligent control system where a drying curve has been implemented into it. So spray chamber and atomizer system. Um, here, here, the spray chamber should be designed to minimize the approach temperature uh, while maintaining good drying. So it would be great to run at a low approach temperature from a lime consumption standpoint, but oftentimes that leads to wall deposits and, and wet material making it to the bag house. So really you need to uh, have the residence time and, and proper drying conditions to ensure that you have a good byproduct um, while at the same time balancing that with trying to minimize uh, lime consumption. Um, here a service that we can provide to help with determining the best approach temperature is spray chamber temperature profiling. This service involves bringing uh, some, some thermocouple chains out and uh, measuring the temperature along the periphery of the spray chamber. Um, this helps create a, a, a map of, of the temperature in the spray chamber um, for various conditions. Um, and that can, that can often be used to set the, uh, the outlet temperature and, and ensure that there's good drying performance. In addition, as you try to minimize your approach temperature, there's also a beneficial uh, volumetric flow effect on the fabric filter as the uh, air to cloth ratio uh, goes down. And lastly, a thing to keep in mind here is to ensure good gas distribution. Um, here, our system has, has a, uh, a roof gas disperser and a central gas disperser to really ensure that there's good gas liquid contact um, during the SO2 scrubbing process and uh, occasional erosion or, or plugging of, of either of these components can, can lead to maldistribution, which uh, diminishes performance. So the particulate control device here, um, there's, there's different options. Uh, pulse jet fabric filter is, is often coupled with an SDA, um, primarily because it has uh, improved removal of various acid gases due to the cake that forms, but uh, electrostatic precipitators are also an option. So if a, uh, if your existing uh, particulate control device is an electrostatic precipitator, uh, you could consider an upgrade to a, a pulse jet fabric filter. However, this might be limited by, by fan performance. Um, other options to improve performance across a pulse jet fabric filter are fil filter bag upgrades. Um, this is replacing old bags or even uh, using improved bag materials that create a thicker cake and, and lead to more uh, removal of various acid gases. Some things to consider here is uh, that you, you could also operate at a higher pressure drop. Um, and that, that again, creates a thicker filter cake and better uh, gas uh, solid contact for SO2 removal. Um, other pieces that, that are helpful as well include adding or upgrading the hopper heaters to ensure free flowing solids, cold coating um, the bag house to reduce corrosion. Um, here, we're aware of some customers that have uh, uh, run at higher approach temperatures than necessary just, just for bag house corrosion purposes. So this would be a, a helpful solution there. Um, and lastly, repair leaks, insulation, and, and lagging on, on older pulse jet fabric filters or reverse air fabric filters. Hey, Mike, so, real quick, um, I, I had a question for you. Um, as you were talking about the, the bag house optimization and pressure drop, have you guys ever been involved work where you guys have looked at or got some data to see what kind of SO2 removal itself is occurring just within, say, the SDA vessel versus what's occurring just across the bag house? So, so we have in different different applications, and I think it's varied significantly. I don't have any good numbers off the top of my head, and I have to get back to you. Um, but, but others on the call might, might be able to help with that question. So the SDA control system, that's also an opportunity for, for improvements. Uh, typically, the SO2 emission set point is used to set lime slurry flow, while the outlet temperature is set to uh, set recycle flow. Um, however, there's, there's uh, more complicated control systems that can be implemented. Um, you can add humidity monitoring, which the humidity of the spray dryer outlet gas uh, impacts drying performance directly. And, uh, with, with changes in humidity of the incoming flue gas and spray down and as a result of temperatures, 
Um, improved humidity monitoring lets you more closely operate uh, a more aggressive approach temperature. Uh, in addition, we had mentioned some uh, thermocouple chain testing and temperature profiling. The results of this can be implemented into a drying curve, um, which will link the recycle slurry solids set point with, with the approach temperature. Um, in addition, um, I'd like to add that, that we do have some facilities that have run at uh, an approach temperature as low as 25F. Uh, I don't think this is an option for most facilities, but with a uh, large amount of operator vigilance, it, it is possible. Um, and the last thing before moving on to the next slide that I'd like to bring up is that uh, in today's, today's times with uh, high cycling of, of coal plants, um, those load changes can impact the drying performance. So there's opportunities there to temporarily increase the approach temperature before load changes, just to make sure you don't have any wall wetting events. And the last slide that I'll present before passing this on to, to Mike Kuziak is uh, the impact of air heater leakage. Um, air heater leakage is generally detrimental to everything across the SDA process. Um, this happens because it, it increases the gas volume since you have more gas coming in um, or ambient air. Um, it also cools the gas that's coming into the, the spray dryer, thereby limiting the amount of slurry flow. Um, the increases in gas volume that I mentioned increases pressure drop and decreases residence time in the spray chamber. You can see the impact for a case that we ran here, um, a jump from 5% leakage, which is a, a well buttoned up air heater, up to 25% leakage. The overall SDA pressure drop increased uh, almost one and a half inches, and the uh, residence time of that spray chamber dropped from 10.7 seconds to 9.2 seconds. So this can be significant from a drying perspective and, and making sure you can run at a uh, lower approach temperature. So you'd be penalized there on that. Um, the one area where it is beneficial is uh, it actually reduces water consumption, um, but you know as I said that that limits lime slurry uh, flow as a result. But if you are in a uh, area where water is not highly available, and that is a driver at your facility, um, high air heater leakage would actually bring that down. So other impacts with the, uh, from the high air heater leakage include higher bag house air to cloth ratio, um, higher pressure drop across the flues, and higher fan power. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Kuziak. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm going to let Mike maintain control of the, uh, the slides and have him switch slides for me so we don't have to transition it to my control. So thank you. Good morning. Uh, so Mike and I have provided a list of SD upgrade options in approximate order of increasing cost. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's a good start for most customers. So the first one, the coal change. Um, Changing from a higher sulfur PRB coal to a lower sulfur PRB may allow the plant to achieve a lower emission with the existing SDA equipment. However, changing from other coal rank to a PRB would probably be prohibitively expensive due to boiler mods required. Um, increasing lime slurry flow has a number of issues associated with it. We'll discuss these issues in, in more detail in a few slides. Uh, Mike already discussed individual subsystem improvements in previous slides, so no need to rehash over those. Supplemental dry sorbent injection using hydrated lime is a relatively simple solution, one that we'll also discuss in just a, just a moment here. Um, ash recycle system addition significantly improves both lime stoichiometry and drying conditions in the SDA, but it can be an expensive upgrade. Ash recycle also provides a possible avenue to eliminate place, plant wastewater. Coin tower blowdown, for example, to help the plant achieve zero liquid discharge. The takeaway here, the main takeaway is ash recycle improves lime utilization. SDA vessel upgrades. Often increased SDA removal requires increased atomizer feed rates, and this in turn requires increased SDA vessel residence time in or a larger vessel. This is a costly option as upgrading aging corroded vessels is, is mechanically risky. So additional SDA vessels may be required or even new replacement vessels. Converting the SDA system to a circulating dry scrubber system is the most costly option. Reusing the existing fabric filter may be possible, but difficulties are likely. <clears throat> so 
when queries come in, customers may ask the logical question, why can't we just inject more Lyme to get the increased removal? You know, often though, this existing SD system has limitations. The atomizers may be limited. The Lyme prep equipment may be undersized. The Lyme slurry flow control station may be undersized. Or the SDA may not have the evaporative capacity, and just not enough energy in the form of gas temperature to evaporate the increased Lyme feed. Uh, the, the SDA evaporative capacity is the most difficult to upgrade. Adding more Lyme slurry may not be possible on a once through or single pass system without violating minimum approach temperature limitations or weighing the walls or weighing the bag house. On systems with ash recycle, adding Lyme slurry typically dilutes the atomizer feed, and this risks driving the system into unsafe drying conditions. So dry sorbent injection using hydrated lime may be the simple solution to extend the SDA performance window. On the first pass, the, S the DSI enriches the lime on the filter bags, improving acid gas removal. But more significantly on systems with ash recycle, the unrelected lime from the bag house is transported to the ash recycle system, is wetted down with the recycled ash slurry and improves alkalinity and atomizer spray on the second pass and in subsequent passes. So it gives you improved lime utilization. So this slide here provides some details into an investigation for a customer system using supplemental hydrated Lyme DSI. Supplemental DSI addition to SDA is a patented system. It extends the SDA performance window and has also demonstrated improved SO2 removal during the boiler unit startup. Using supplemental DSI in our example, the SDA system removal improved 91%, 95% at full load using the same Lyme slurry feed rate with the addition of the hydrated Lyme. The chart shown is based on a facility which was limited by their lime slaking capacity, which prevented them from achieving over 91% removal. The hydrated lime addition increased the overall lime, overall lime consumption as calcium oxide by about two and a half percent in this case. Generally, there are several factors that impact lime increase, such as recycle rate, the lime slaking conditions, and the hydrated lime properties. In the chart here, just to clarify, the 10% dry lime addition means that of the total lime added to the system, 10% is dry hydrated lime, while 90% is the wet lime slurry. We should also note that most coal-fired applications use, that use slake lime for lime slurry preparation, while something on DSI is going to be using hydrated lime. So a new reagent silo, a new reagent delivery system will be required for most plants. So recently, B&W did an engineering study for a customer with an existing SDA baghouse system in the upper Midwest. Based on the proposed regional, regional haze regulations, the plant needed to improve estrogen removal from 70 to 96%. The system currently operates at 15% lime slurry and 25 weight percent recycled slurry with an approach temperature of 55 degrees Fahrenheit. B&W reviewed the system and determined that the combined residence time of the SDA vessels was too low to handle the additional atomizer feed. It was also determined that the existing plant lime prep system would be adequate if the recycled slurry solids were increased from 25 to 40%, which has the co-benefit of improving drying conditions in the SDA. Also, the existing fabric filter was found to have adequate filtration area for the upgrade, and the ash handling system already had the capacity to handle the increased solids loading. So the solution that B&W determined was to provide two brand new SDA vessels replacing existing vessels retrofit upstream and outboard of the existing bag house. The ash recycle system was upgraded to produce 40% slurry solids and the SDA could safely handle the gas conditions at a 35 degree approach temperature. The end result was that the improved lime stoichiometry due to ash recycle upgrade partially offset the lime consumption increase needed for improved SO2 removal. As Mike discussed earlier, another critical point that this case study uncovered was the importance of maintaining low air hydrate leakage rates. The SDA system just needs high air heater outlet temperature to maintain the vapor capacity. Converting the SDA baghouse system to a CDS baghouse system has the upshot of higher SO2 removal possibilities without directly coupling lime addition to the water spray. However, this conversion has complications. While it is possible that the existing baghouse and ID fans could be reused under the right circumstances and gas conditions, in most cases, the bag house may not have adequate filtration area. It's just too small for a CDS application. And from an arrangement standpoint, the bag house elevation may be too low to incorporate air slides for ash recirculation back to the CDS vessel. The other drawback is that this would be the highest 
cost option and likely a higher operating option as well with the line uh, stoichiometry being slightly higher for a CDS versus the SDA. In this slide, you can see how the CDS bag house system is in most cases located in the same place as the SDA bag house system. Also, you can see how the bag house elevation for the CDS allows for air slides to move recirculation solids from the bag house hoppers to the CDS venturis. That's not the case on an SDA, so there may be some difficulties, but it can, the possibility is still there to convert. Okay, from this slide, just some miscellaneous comments. Determining gas conditions is extremely important when considering an upgrade for the SDA. The customer may consider a formal baseline test to establish the design gas flow for the upgrade project. And also the EPA AP42 emissions factors can be helpful in determining the path forward for a plant upgrade. These factors allow the four factor analysis to take credit for the beneficial effect the fly ash alkalinity has on the SDA performance. Oftentimes we would discard the, uh, the ash alkalinity, but um, when you're trying to improve SDA performance marginally, it may make sense to go ahead and consider it. That's it for the BNW upgrades here. Um, I guess before we open the floor to questions, uh, please feel free to send inquiries to BNW's Justin Chenevy, Mike or I, or local BNW sales office. So at this time, I guess any questions or comments are welcome. All right, thanks guys. That was a really informative presentation. And uh, you know, a lot, a lot of what you said there is, you know, it's, uh, I, I've, I've had a lot of those same observations as well. Very much in agreement with everything you just said. Um, I do have a question for Mike Clytus there and, and his for earlier portion of the presentation. Um, one of the things that I was curious about is, you know, Every now and then you'll come across a plant that has a large temperature stratification across the air preheater outlet duct. What, what observations or experiences have you had in regards to uh, performance or mitigations that you may have had to do to address those kind of solutions and, and or th those kind of uh, issues? And, you know, is it when you start talking about DSI supplement to traditional SDA, um, how, how does that temperature stratification impact any of those decisions about injection locations and number of lances? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Travis. Uh, thank you for it. Uh, we have seen plants with significant temperature stratifications. I think you'd be surprised at how, how much temperature can, can vary from uh, one SDA to the other. Uh, I think normally our, our roof gas dispersers and central gas dispersers do a good job mixing that gas and evening out that temperature stratification as it gets down into the spray cloud. Um, however, if, if your flues split from unit to unit um, or between two different spray chambers or three different spray chambers, then you end up with a, a temperature gradient between uh, the inlet gases of each of them. Um, and in those cases, the, the spray dryers do end up operating differently. Um, in terms of the, the dry hydrated lime injection to it, I think we could, we could potentially include multiple locations uh, or multiple injection locations unique to each of the spray chambers to ensure that you get um, even lime flow between the, the, uh, the units, however many there are, um, depending on, on what kind of spray down they're looking at and, and what kind of performance um, they're trying to, trying to hit. A great question. Um, we did get a question from the audience from uh, Kevin Redinger. He asked, any upgrade opportunities for the rotary atomizers or interest in dual fluid nozzle atomizer replacement? Yeah, so, so another good question. Um, we have done backup dual fluid nozzle systems in the past, um, and, and that helps uh, facilities, you know, when they're pulling their atomizer, maintain spray down um, and, and SO2 removal as well. Um, and in terms of rotary atomizers, we do have a, a, a parts department that, uh, can evaluate rotary atomizers that, that are installed and, and provide our, our latest and greatest um, models and, and help reduce any maintenance and performance issues there. Um, as we talked about um, DSI, I know you guys presented on like startup and you know the one about kind of supplemental SO2 controls. Are you guys seeing more interest or opportunities that there's a potential that a DSI could supplement an SDA in terms of just normal operation and provide a holistic 
not just environmental controls, but overall from a from a total cost of ownership, um, operation and maintenance. Uh, you know, is there is there some perspective where DSI could have a place from that perspective too? Especially given the way that coal units are kind of you know up and down with load more so than probably when the SDAs were initially designed. Yeah, so that, that was the intent of this slide. Um, I think it is possible. We have seen a lot of customers uh, wanting to go that way, whether it's for, you know, because of the high maintenance with recycle systems that they're seeing. Um, we have had customers make that request. And really, I think it's a case by case basis and that you need to look at it for your plant specifically. Um, a lot of things went into the development of, of this, this chart. Um, some, some things that impact how much of a penalty you'll take for the dry hydrated lime injection include the amount of recycle, the properties of the lime, how well you're running your lime slaking system currently. Um, but all those things should be considered and, and uh, you know, we'd, we'd be happy to do studies to, to help customers make, make that determination on whether that's right for them um, or not and input the uh, conditions specific to their facility to get an accurate prediction for that. Okay. Um, I, I did have a question too. Uh, I know on one of the slides you were showing like the rotary atomizer and you talked about the, you know, the temperature, kind of the stratification and, and monitoring. I think, yeah, I think it was like slide eight. Um, there you go. Uh, I asked a couple of questions on this. I mean, these are great points. Do you guys, have you guys, and do you guys see like use of say CFD modeling with spray dryers? Is that, is that another solution that you see people using or could be using as far as looking at the, the spray temperature profile. Um, it, what's been your experience with that? I'll let Mike answer that one. I think he has more experience with it, but I do know that we, we have done CFD modeling for spray dryers and that it's frequently requested by customers as well. I don't, I don't know how much you have to add, Mike. Yeah, I would say, um, yeah, a few customers, uh, Covanta in particular, they, they do have success uh, modeling uh, the spray dryer. Um, especially you know, the roof gas disperser and the gas distribution and drying in the, in, in the spray dryer. So um, <clears throat> it can be done. Um, and we do often get requests for that. Uh, sometimes the customers take on that uh, responsibility for themselves though. So that's, that's what I can add to the conversation here. Okay. And as far as, um, in other in other ways to like look at say like the the atomizer operation because because you know from what I've seen out there and kind of what you guys are presenting here obviously getting good gas distribution as a function of operation and maintenance and, and whatnot as well but I mean what what kind of tools or what kind of diagnostics are people able to look at to recognize that say that there's some kind of temperature stratification associated whether it's gas distribution or something with the spray chamber atomizer system what 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 should they be looking at to I guess, recognize a problem before it actually gets catastrophic. So I think the temperature distribution question, which if you have multiple spray chambers, like we talked about before, you actually see a different amount of water that's evaporated across the different spray chambers. Um, and I think that's a good way to know that you are having temperature stratification issues. The, the other brute force methods are just to, to you know, go to the inlet flue and, and create an array of temperatures um, and a temperature profile come into each, each spray dryer. Um, and, and then, you know, using that possibly to support a CFD model to, to come up with some type of mixing device to even out that stratification. I, I'll add to that, Mike, that, you know, some customers come to us with the same question. And, um, you know, we, we recommend, hey, you got to make sure that your thermocouple chains, um, you got to monitor the temperature vigilantly uh, to make sure you're not wetting the walls to make sure not covering the walls. Unfortunately, uh, some customers don't find out they have a problem until they uh, have an outage and go inside and see that there's a donut of, uh, of um, uh, deposits in the vessel. So I guess more vigilance in, in, uh, in the control room, watching the temperatures uh, from the, the thermocouple chains is probably the best way to, to make sure you're, you're fully drying the spray cloud. What, what, I mean, is it common? Do, do a lot of people have those thermocouple chains or? Um, you know, what, I guess, what percentage of the users do you guys see and talk to out there that, that use this and, and use it as a tool appropriately? I would say some of our customers, uh, you know, the earlier ones uh, don't have that. Um, some of them have been retrofitted, uh, uh, but I think most of them after a certain date, and I can't remember exactly the date, it became more or less a standard uh, offering. Um, so, 
I mean, it, it just depends on the customer if if uh, they want to closely monitor and, and watch the system, and that's just their um, typical operating procedures. So it, it's it, it, it's hit or miss. And, and a lot of times we go in and do like a temporary test, um, where we set up thermocouple chains and we can move those around from location to location. Uh, oftentimes, once we do that test, we'll have customers that ask us to leave the chains in and uh, ultimately end up hooking them up to their DCS system. Okay. Um, and I had a question, I think it was a couple of slides back on the, on the slaking. Um, you know, you talked about the importance of the 175 degrees for target temperature and, you know, the, the subsequent lime slurry quality. Um, what, do, what do you guys see in terms of, so if an end user is, you know, learning about their lime slaking system and they want to generate good quality lime slurry, what, what parameters you know, should they be looking for to measure in, in terms of grabbing slurry samples and just, just checking to make sure they're properly slaking? I think, I think the tests we normally do here are, you know, before it's like the lime reactivity. Um, I think other things you do afterwards is the particle size distribution of the slurry along with the uh, available surface area. And I think that's usually done with the BT surface area analysis. Um, I don't know, Mike, if you have anything else to add to that. Now that just about sums it up. Um, there's other things you can do. Um, I'm not an expert, uh, particularly in lime slaking, but we do have folks at BNW who are, and can't help the customer if there's issues in that uh, with that equipment. And I think it would be possible. I know for our uh, wet FGD technology, we have like a limestone reactivity test. I think we could probably modify that and do something similar for for a lime slurry, and uh, and provide results there as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I just think this is interesting information, and I don't know, you know, um, from a from a process perspective, I don't know how many people are, are checking their lime slurry quality, and obviously, at the end of the day, that's the most important deliverable towards in terms of the, what's going into your SDA as far as uh, you know the effective, you know, SO two removal. So, um, all right. Well, I apologize for bouncing around with questions, you guys, and we have a few minutes, and you know, I think you guys presented a lot of a lot of good stuff, and. Um, and for me, one, one question I have, uh, one last question is just in general about the ash recycle systems. I, I mean, is it is it common, I guess, for, are you seeing a lot of folks that have a retrofitting ash recycle systems or, um, you know, are, are people typically designing those up front? And, and in terms of what kind of return on investment, I know you mentioned this can be, you know, there's obviously capital installed with it, but terms of what what are you guys seeing with this solution as far as reduction in fresh lime slurry consumption and ROIs as, as far as people putting in these systems? We've known for years and the industry has known for years that uh, ash recycle uh, is highly beneficial for on lime consumption and pays for itself rather quickly. So that, that's not a secret. Um, but presently, we're not seeing a lot of activity requesting um, ash recycle system addition. Um, but in the future for customers, it's something that we, they really need to consider um, if they have a once through system or you know, a single pass system, or if their current ash recycle system isn't performing well, or just doesn't do very high uh, solids percent. Um, we do know that we can drive recycle solids to 40% slur, uh, weight percent slurry, even 45%. Um, to really help drying and really beneficially uh, reduce your lime consumption. So uh, currently to answer your question, Jerry, it is, currently we're not seeing a lot of activity with that, but we think we will in, in the near future. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and, and as far as like that example drying curve, is that something that end users are typically, as they install a system or looking to optimize, is that something that they, they do or should do, or you suggest that they do in order to kind of opti help optimize this solution? reliably? Yeah, we, we do. We think it's a, it's a pretty big benefit, um, especially because you're, you're trying to balance the reduced lime stoichiometry and consumption against uh, your outlet temperature and your drying risks. So it, it, it is a good way to, to determine where your system specifically can, can operate best, given the, uh, the current circumstances of that plant, which may have changed significantly, right? I mean, there could be uh, higher yeah. leakage um, or, you know, a fuel switch. So the system is operating different from design, but this will help screen out those potential issues and, and uh, set it up for, for success under the current conditions. Yeah, 
makes sense. And, and, and how much in terms of process dependence on, on developing that curve, um, you know, whether load changes or um, fuels changes, like do those curves tend to change a lot that when a process change occurs or something changes that you suggest people go back and recalculate those or do they stay pretty, pretty consistent once you develop it for that site specifically? Yeah, another good question. Um, yeah, so the, the curve would change at different loads. And I think normally when we go out and set up for the, uh, you know, for testing for a few days um, or leave the chains in permanently, um, I think we try to bring out as many of those potential issues and differences as we can. Okay. All right, I know we're, we're at the end. So uh, again, thank you to both Mike and Mike um, and uh, appreciate you guys answering all the questions and uh, we'll kick it back over to our host, Travis, to wrap us up. Thank all you. Right. Yeah, th thanks, Jerry. Thanks, guys. Great presentation. Really good content and good, uh, good discussion there as well. Uh, before we wrap up here, I want to give one more shout out to another sponsor we've got, and that's Mi a Mississippi Lime Company uh, based in St. Louis. They are a leading global supplier of high quality lime products. I've been in the business for over a century now. Uh, they operate the largest lime facilities in the Americas, and they mine and produce some of the purest limestone uh, products out there you can you can purchase. Uh, they provide high quality uh, quick lime, hydrated lime, all those uh, various DSI related type products as well. So big, big shout out to uh, uh, Mississippi Lime, as well as uh, fellow board member Kurt Bean, who has been with us for a while, and he's been a been an instrumental cog in, in pulling things together here for us. I also want to give a, another thank you to the presenters uh, and, and the content you bring, because if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have, uh, you know, we wouldn't have the audience here watching and we'd all just be kind of sitting around talking about Jerry's mustache, I think. So, so I really appreciate, uh, <laughs> appreciate all, all that you do. Uh, speaking of uh, content and presenters, if you want to get involved, you know, we're always looking for new ideas. So if you have a thought or a topic that you think someone may like to hear, uh, you know, get get in touch with one of us uh, board members, look up the SUA website, shoot over an abstract, and we'll give it a look. Uh, keep on the lookout for the upcoming May webinar topics, and that should be coming out soon, as well as uh, emails regarding the recordings of this particular webinar. So that'll be communicated here as soon as possible. So once again, we really appreciate everyone joining in. You know, go to the DSUA website. You can find any information you're looking for about becoming a member, getting access to the archives, and uh, just uh, have yourself a great day, and thank you for joining. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.